right, so uh, the first thing that I'm going to tell you about me is that I have a speech impediment. I stutter. And that uh, has informed pretty much my entire view on communication. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about me and stuttering just for a uh, couple of minutes because I have an adorable picture of me when I was a little kid. Uh, I'm around three years old in this picture, and uh, this is when my parents told me uh, that they first, you know, saw signs of stuttering. Uh, they weren't all that concerned about it, though, because, you know, tons of kids at uh, that age, you know, have some sort of speech impediment. And by the time they hit like uh, four or five, it just kind of hoes away. Um, stuttering is also uh, genetic. So like my mom did, like my dad stuttered, my brothers did. I've got some cousins and, and family members as well that stuttered, and theirs kind of just uh, disappeared by the time they hit, you know, either 10 or 12 or 17, you know, 20. Like, it just kind of uh, went away. Like, mine, uh, is here, and I'm 32, so apparently I'm going to be having to uh, ex experience this for the uh, rest of my life. And so um, stutterers, like we kind of do these things uh, to try to avoid stuttering. So, so uh, we use a lot of killer words, like, um, uh, you know, and we think, uh, see, like I just did it. Uh, we think that if we use like those words, we're going to be more fluent. Um, another thing that we do is just avoid uh, certain conversations because we have these trigger words where we know uh, 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 that if we have to say, you know, the word cat, like it's just not going to come out. So we will just avoid conversations about cats. Um, and so me, Personally, like I came to a point where I was so overwhelmed with stuttering and I was so afraid to talk that I just stopped talking. Um, I stopped going to events where I was going to have to, you know, say my name or, or talk about what I did for a living because I was so afraid of being judged, right? Like when you are different, people look at you like you're weird. It's like, hi, I'm Sharon. It's like, how come you don't know your name, right? Like it's a very weird conversation when you can't say things how, you know, people, you know, can just talk. I can't. And so I uh, was, was was terrified of talking, so I stopped talking, and then I uh, I came to a point in my life where I knew that I was going to have to overcome this fear, so I hid that by pursuing public speaking, and I know that sounds completely insane. It's like I'm afraid of you know swimming. I'm going to go swim with sharks, but. <laughs> That's just how my brain works. I'm like, okay, like I'm going to conquer this fear, and I'm going to, you know, 
try to just be more comfortable communicating. And so the first couple of talks I gave, um, uh, I talked about stuttering and um, I talked about patience. And um, uh, the theme of it was patience in a, f a, f a fast paced world. And so like I thought that people would kind of get from it like, oh, okay, like, like, we don't have to rush, right? Like, we don't have to have everything right now. Uh, uh, we can just be calmer, we can be patient, and things will be fine. However, uh, uh, the message that people uh, really did get was that of being vulnerable and and um, being empathetic, and I thought that was weird because those two words I never said at all, like not one time it in the in the in the five talks I gave, and so it kind of. Uh, dawned on me that stuttering, you know, forces me one to be vulnerable, but it also uh, encourages, you know, the people paying attention, the people listening, to be extremely empathetic. And so, uh, so. What's empathy? Um, I know that it's like a really big buzzword, and you know, people tell you all the time, like the skill that you have to learn now is this one. Like y you have to be empathetic, right? So if you look it up, uh, the definition is uh, to to. Uh, share and um, embrace the feelings of, uh, of the, the people around you. And I think that's fine, right? But that really doesn't uh, truly um, uh, uh, truly help you to 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 fully understand like how to be you know a great empath so my definition is that empathy is a choice that you have to make right like it's an action you choose to have empathy every single day you choose to to go into to the conversations that you have with empathy. And so the two most impactful um, empathy actions are going to be uh, uh, listening and speaking. So I'm going to kind of uh, talk us um, uh, some more about that a a little bit later. But first, I want to kind of touch on. Um, uh, um, 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 how to sh show people that being empathetic is important, right? Like we all know that it's important, but, but the people on our teams, uh, they might not know that. And so how do we sh show them this, right? Like how do we prove to them that 
uh, that empathy is a, a skill, is a trait that is valuable and that they should engage in it. We have to uh, turn it around and, and m m m m make it about them. So, so, how do we make it about them? Well, we have to entice them with culture. So, a lot of people kind of view culture as the, uh, the things that we get as a result of being a part of a group of people. So either a company or a family or whatever it is, right? So a lot of the, th of the things that we view as culture are actually just perks. So uh, things like having dry cleaning done for you, like having a, a um, private chef come in and uh, cook you meals every day. Yeah, like those things are great, but that's not culture. That's a perk of being in the building, right? Like perks are going to make uh, uh, your life easier. They aren't going to make your life inherently any better. So culture is the, uh, the best reason to, to be a part of a company, to be a part of a movement, right? The problem though is culture is also the best reason to get completely away from that same thing. Um, the best example of this uh, right now is what's happening with Uber, right? Like who wants to be a part of that right now? It's because of their culture. So when you are trying to convince the people on your teams uh, to be great empaths, um, you are going to tell them that it's about um, improving the culture. So what you're actually talking about is improving the community. And so community and culture aren't exactly the same thing, right? Communities are inclusive and they are diverse because they really value the diversity of, of, of thoughts and the diversity of ideas. And they thrive on empowering those who are going to think a, a little bit differently than the status quo. And so if you are creating a really great community, culture is going to completely take care of of itself. So you, um, you, you want to have a great community and a great culture, but how do you create those things? How do you cultivate community? Well, that goes back to being empathetic. And so how do you turn empathy into a, a verb? Well, that goes back to the way you communicate. Now, um, before in the talk, I said that the two most impactful um, 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 empathy actions are the way we talk and, uh, and uh, the way that we listen. And so uh, I'm first going to talk about listening. 
because I think it's extremely, extremely important. So um, as a stutterer, there are a ton of uh, resources out there that um, you can use to kind of, you know, like make just life easier, right? Like make stuttering easier and um, that fun stuff. Uh, there's also a conference um, and uh, uh, and uh, that happens um, pretty much every year, I think. It's like five days long. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the conference is, uh, or yeah, well, is the first time where, you know, the m m m m majority of people there are like just surrounded by people who stutter. And it is uh, quite the experience because it's exciting and it's terrifying and it's kind of overwhelming, um, especially when you are a first timer. And so my first time was in 2014. And so, uh, yeah, so I was there for five days and, and um, I didn't really know like what to expect and it turned out to be fine. I mean, I, I made a lot of friends and, and experienced feeling like I was, you know, like not weird for the first time ever, which was pretty cool. Uh, on the final day, though, um, uh, they had a first-time father come up and s speak to the um, entire conference, and there was about a thousand people there, and so uh, this was no s small task. And he said, "Look, I." was not you know, interested in coming here. I didn't really uh, see the value in coming to a conference on a thing that, um, uh, that you just can't cure. Um, and then he said, um, uh, uh, that he went to all of the parent workshops and he talked to every s s single person uh, that he could and that he really paid attention to things that the other people who s s stuttered had to say. And then he said, you know, as a result of just investing my time and just really listening, um, uh, that he was able to better, you know, embrace and, and, and understand exactly like what his kids were going through. And, and I thought that was really interesting because he emphasized that he really paid attention to people, that he really listened to the words that um, people said. Um, and listening is probably the greatest act of empathy that we can do. Um, we need to listen without bias, without judgment, and then really, you know, embrace and understand the words that the other person is saying is, excuse me, saying. Um, the other thing that I kind of want to stress about uh, listening is that 
is that it's not just you know you waiting for your turn to talk. It's an active part of the conversations that you're in, right? Conversations are constant in engagement. So the other act of empathy is uh, the way that we speak. And um, um, I, uh, I, uh, I used to work at a newspaper uh, back when people actually read like print, you know, like newspapers. This was back in like 2004. So um, uh, uh, there was one IT guy uh, for a building of like 300 people. Yes, again, this was 2004. And uh, the problems that um, he would have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis were things like printer jams or, you know, things like that, that were just really boring and not like actual problems. And so, and so if you would come to him for pretty much anything, he would be one, extremely annoyed, and two, be like, well, did you turn it off and turn it on again? Every single time, right? It didn't matter what you said. Like, hey, like I'm getting this thing, like, like uh, this, uh, this green is red. Okay, well, could you restart? Hey, the building's on fire. Did you restart? <laughs> and I would just be like, look, like I really need your help, and you're just kind of being a dick, so <laughs> I don't know how to talk to you. And so I finally kind of came to this point with him of like, look, like it's, you know, like 12.30, we are, you know, like way past deadline, and I needed his help, and so I came to him and I said, look, there's this thing that's happening. Here's the exact error message. I turned the computer off, I turned it on again. It was doing the same thing. I went to another computer, I turned it off, I turned it on, and it's doing the same thing. Can you help me? And he said, yeah. He came over to the computer, and then he walked me through it. He explained everything that he did, and he was really nice about it. And I just thought that was really weird because he had always kind of been a jerk, except this one time when I was like, here's my exact problem. And then it kind of dawned on me, I spoke to him in a way that he could truly understand and truly embrace. I made his job easier. I made him feel like you know, he was a part of the team. And all I had to do was just talk to him in a way that he could really, really, really get. So the thing about empathy is that it's a choice that you have to make during every you know, conversation. Um, if it's either on the phone or if it's in person or if it's you know on the line, that's a choice that you have to make, especially on your teams, right? And so if your team is based around um, being empathetic, people are going to embrace uh, whatever it is uh, that they are assigned to do. You know, people are going to embrace their roles because they are, go are going to completely understand that that it doesn't matter how big or s s small the 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 
roles are, that every single role is going to be incredibly important. Empathy is also going to you know, encourage a diversity of thought and a diversity of ideas. And that makes empathy um, a fostering device for incredibly powerful communities, for great communities. And true empathy is powerful because you are going to give it the power that it needs in order to make your teams, your communities excel. So when you embrace empathy and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, when you make it the foundation of your culture and the cornerstone of your community, you are going to be more s successful than you would if you just focus on, you know, plain culture. True empathy is powerful because you give it the power. Thank you. The question was tips and tricks for public speaking. You should just do it. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like there really isn't, um, there's no s s secrets. It's just s sign up and then do it. You know, um, I think the most s surprising thing about it is that people are generally very s supportive of, a, of a, the person who was up on stage. And so it's not gonna be a bad experience, it's just gonna be a little bit, you know, terrifying, like in the beginning, <laughs> but you'll be fine. Yeah, just do it. How can a company teach empathy? Well, um, uh, there are exercises that uh, you can do, like uh, um, uh, team building type exercises, but um, I can talk to you about that later, just because uh, that's gonna take, you know, like a while to talk about. But um, the best way to teach it is to um, be an example, like one, and two, just really um, pay attention to what um, people are saying, right, and don't, um, like cut down ideas, right? Like uh, the things that happens in um, meetings is that, you know, people are afraid to speak up for a, uh, a variety of reasons. So um, if you, as a m -m 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 manager, if you encourage you know, the people on your team to, s to uh, speak up equally, then that's a thing that uh, you could do to encourage empathy. But uh, we can talk later, because there's like a lot of different things, and that would take a while to kind of go through, <laughs> so. So how, how do you think someone can empathize if they haven't had a personal situation? So when I empathize, I try to take some experience in my life and directly correlate it to what I'm hearing. So how do you think someone can relate if they don't have that experience? Well, I think that that just comes down to just tapping into a uh, vulnerability like across the board, right? Like we've all experienced, um, you know, like extreme sadness. We've all ex um, experienced, you know, pain and s suffering and, and uh, the positive emotions as well. And so if we just think about how we felt when, 
you know, we were hurting for whatever reason, it's going to make it easier for us to, you know, kind of um, 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 sh share those feelings with the other person, um, despite the fact that we haven't, you know, experienced that same exact thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Terrific. Thank you again, Sharon. Thank you.